Are atheists closer to the truth than believers? That's the topic. Yes. Now, um, so I hope everybody here can take a little irreverent conversation about God, but I believe that having a candid and frank discussion on these matters is far better than just avoiding the discussion of, you know, this three-letter word called God, G-O-D, is fraught with more opinions, disagreements, arguments, wars have been fought, misconceptions than any other word in our vocabulary. You know, there are passionate believers and there are passionate non-believers. There are people who are ready to die for and kill others in the name of God. And there are other people who are ready aggressively to uh, attack anyone in the name of no God. So when you have such diversity, really you have to get back to the question is, is there really a disagreement? And um, perhaps the first thing to do is define what do we mean by God? Because if we have different definitions, we clearly are never going to be able to come to terms whether we believe or not believe in something without first defining the axiomatic definition of what the meaning of God is. Rav Yitzhak Badishiva put it really powerfully when he said to a self-proclaimed atheist, he said to him, the God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. Which essentially means that first you have to define what God means. Now every human being on earth fits somewhere on the spectrum. As I said, there are between the extremes of radical believers and radical atheists, you have moderate atheists, I've come to learn. You have uh, uh, radical and moderate agnostics. You have moderate believers. And everyone fits in somewhere there. But as I'll suggest here, I think that many of the ideas around God and all the implications of God are really filled with many prejudices and just uh, locked in positions without really thinking about what we're saying or what we're believing in. Because take, for example, this phenomenon. People who say, I absolutely believe in God, and yet they behave in a way that's antithetical to God. And then you have someone else who can say, I don't believe in God, and they behave in a far more noble and ethical way than a, the so-called believer does. So what do these words mean? Just because somebody says they believe, but if their actions are in, not consistent with what they believe, and someone else says, I don't believe, and their actions are very fine, very refined, like a godly person, so then what do these words mean anyway? Is it just like slogans? You know, some people belong to this club and that club. Maybe it should be measured by actions. And if measured by actions, I would think that there are very few believers that really can say that 24-7 they live their lives as if God is right near, near them and every action and every word that comes out of their mouth and every thought they have is guided by that principle. I would challenge anyone to find a person like that. So to say that one believes in God and say one does not believe, does that have any significance? Does that have any meaning? Now let's take this a little further. Um, a little more philosophical even. To say God exists, one has to really define what does the word exist mean? What does the word exist mean? For example, if you said, does love exist? Um, someone will say, well, based on empirical evidence of the five senses, you can't prove that love exists. Just like you can't see subatomic particles. So the word exists is, a very, uh, is also a very deceptive word. You know, for one person, something exists. For another person, on a different level, it doesn't exist. You know, you see, we see uh, f uh, physical objects in this world. We could see with our eyes. We hear sounds. We taste, touch, and smell. But none of those five senses can, cast, can capture the, uh, what a molecule or an atom or a subatomic particle looks like. So then you have to define what the word exists means. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And what criteria do we use? If you take even a step further, the real quandary is this. If indeed there is a creator, I'm only saying if to satisfy the skeptic. If indeed there is a creator, can the creature really be the one that defines whether there's a creator or not. It's the creator that creates the creature, not the creature that creates the creator. 
So what can a creature really say about its creator? What can a piece of art say about the artist? It's a product of the artist. Let's go further. All logic and reason, if indeed there's a creator, the creator also created logic and reason. So to use logic and reason to try to understand the creator is a, contrad is a, is a contradiction of terms. Because you can't bind the creator of logic and reason to the laws of logic and reason. In the words of physicists, something within a system cannot understand something outside of the system. Can we really perceive something outside of our own structure? So then we get ourselves into a complete new dilemma, which is any God we talk about is really a God only simply based on our terms. What we determine is uh, the context and so on. It may not even be what God really is because we're the ones talking about it. Think of it this way. If we're part of a whole reality, how much can the part tell, about, tell us about the whole when you're only a part? You're only one little piece of it. So there are much more dilemmas than one thing when you talk about God, even though people so flippantly talk about God, God exists, I do believe, I don't believe. And then, of course, the fact is that if it was so simple to prove or disprove God, then we'd have no argument, would we? Clearly, it's not that simple. All the proofs are rejected by people who don't want to accept those proofs. And the disproofs are rejected by people who do accept the proofs. So then what are the proofs worth? It's just a matter of choices. And you see that as a fact. You see the way you look at the world. So in a sense, it's like a circular type of argument because you get nowhere. There are people who believe, believe, and those that don't, don't. And you could argue that belief is very much part of culture. Some people grew up with that, and therefore it's comfortable for them to believe in God. And some didn't. Or you could argue the other way around. Those that grew up with it may be the ones that rejected because they saw how hollow or hypocritical it was. So they are prejudiced the other way around. Anyway, as you see, basically, subjectivity comes into play big time in this discussion. So throwing out all these questions, my goal is really to be provocative intentionally, and most importantly, to be able to address this in an intelligent manner, to say what can we know, what can we not know. Because there's no question, there's no question in the world that a, just like a piece of art can tell you very little about the artist, it can tell you that the artist has the capacity to create such art. But what else can it tell you about the artist? If the art was able to speak. Just like a computer or any machine, what can it tell you about its engineer? Very little. Because they're not in the same reality. So the question is, can we even have, do we have even the tools to talk about God? And if we do talk about God, is it not merely simply another God that's an extension of our way of thinking? You know, a God that we decide we need, a crutch, something that we feel gives us solace or comfort, Etc. Etc. <clears throat> so I decided to address this this week for the reason being because in this week's chapter in the Torah is a double chapter, Achrei Kedoshim, and the second of the double chapter, Kedoshim, starts Kedoshim to you, you shall be sanctified, sanctify yourselves. Kedoshim to you, you shall be sacred. It's a commandment. Ki Kadoshani, because I, God, am sacred. The Medrash. The, comment, the Medrash is the oral interpretation of this verse says, Taras Kaunim on Leviticus, on this verse, that what's the what's this meaning of the word be sacred because I am sacred? So it says because, you could think that the Khomeini, that you could be as holy as God is. And the Medrash says, no. Tamalema comes say, Kiani, Kikadashani. My holiness is higher than yours. Which, of course, begs the question, what's the point the Torah is trying to tell us that God is holier than us? I mean, if someone believes in God, that's obvious. So there's an interesting Hasidic interpretation that actually turns around the Medrash and says something quite radical. It says the way you're supposed to read it is, not a question, can we, you may think that you're as holy as God. That's actually read as a statement. You can be as holy as God. Why? Not Lamaila is interpreted as my holiness is greater than yours, but Kedushasi Lamaila, my holiness above, is Mikdushaschem, is derived from and comes from your holiness. In other words, you sanctify me. Which turns the whole meaning around that basically we have the power essentially to make God holy or to desecrate God. So reading that, I just thought it was appropriate. There could be any week this topic, just to talk about God and, and our relationship and understanding of the whole concept and so on and so forth. You want to say something? Well, I think as you said before, that you cannot prove the creator to the creation. Maybe you could, because if you look at a piece of art, you can possibly pretend that it's 
Okay, so then, so then I'm asking you, so 24-7 do you live without God? And have you ever done something that's not godly? If it's so... No, I'm saying, if it's so, so if it's so provable, why is it that you can behave or I can behave in a way that goes against that? So, so, instead, so even if you have, that's a nice argument. And then there are many who just reject it. They have many explanations otherwise. I, you know, I mean, it was a rhetorical question. Um, now, <clears throat> so taking all this into account, I think it's important to first establish a few things. If, I'll go now with the argument, if there is no God, if the universe is uh, in some way evolved on its own, and um, that ball of gas that goes back billions, 12 billion years ago, whatever, either created itself or was always there, however you explain that. Um, Then, of course, obviously with that type of approach, then all we have is ourselves and our own minds, and you can't really go very far with that as far as God goes because there is, you've determined that we're self-made creatures. And really there's no discussion if a person accepts that. Obviously there are many mysteries still to the left because even if you can explain how those gases evolved into forms of life, um, you still have to explain how the gases got there. And as you just said accurately, one of the arguments in the Kuzri and other Jewish and other books is the concept of Ein Dover Eisei nothing can create itself. There's nothing in existence that's self-made. Every one of us is the product of parents. Our parents are the product of parents. Every species, everything on earth comes from some previous form. So then it leads us to say that the earliest form could also not have created itself because we're made of the same substance. That first first cause, so to speak, has to have a cause before it, which is the conventional argument of nothing can create itself. Now, many scientists and others choose not to choose to uh, reject that argument because I believe it's not purely because of logic, because there's also another factor. And I've talked about this to a number of scientists that, I, that consider themselves atheists. I said, I know you accuse believers of being um, closed-minded. You know, a believer just believes, and no proof in the world is going to shake that belief. Right? Whereas a scientist is a person who should be able to be open to all arguments, whether for God or against God, without any prejudice. But there's one question here. We all know that in any type of uh, argument, intelligent argument, there has to be what we call full disclosure. Right? We have to be transparent. Now, in a court of law, the first question that you would ask about any given issue is the parties involved, do they have any bias or any interest in a resolution that is either one way or the other way? If a judge, for example, is invested financially or otherwise, because of a relative in the, in the verdict, being guilty or not guilty, he, has to, he or she has to recuse himself, themselves because they're biased. Now, this God issue has a lot of bias involved. Number one bias is that if there is indeed a God, it would compel us to be accountable. Who wants to be accountable? So we all have a vested interest because if there is a God and it's absolute so, and God puts you here, then that would compel us to, to accept that we are responsible to God. I think many people are invested in making sure they're not responsible and accountable. So I've asked a number of scientists, why don't you make that statement before you make your argument, say, you know something? I have benefit to believe that there is no God because then I can do what I wish. So just like you're expecting believers to be open and transparent and say we have biases because either we believe because we grew up that way or because we believe because it makes us easier to deal with pain or whatever it is, why don't you say the same thing, that you have interest involved in the fact that there is a conclusion that can have consequences. And therefore that would somewhat uh, bias you to try to argue there is no God. Like you'll often hear the argument, very often, that in the primitive times, people had no other way of explaining phenomena except with God. If there was an earthquake, if there was a hurricane, if there was something else that happened, it had to be God's hand. But today that we have natural ways to explain it, scientific ways, we don't need God. That's one of the arguments against God. 
But, that may, but that's, that's a very limited uh, perspective on God. There's many other reasons that you could come to God, even with a world like ours, like I just mentioned, the argument of nothing can create itself. But above all, we all are looking for ways to make our lives more comfortable. If you had a choice to be accountable or not accountable, which one would you choose? If you really had complete choice, and you're honest. Most people would rather be less accountable, let's be honest. Maybe at times, you know, we like the idea to be responsible to someone. But when, on, on our terms, especially when it comes to personal matters. So I searched and searched. I wanted to see if there's any scientist ever in history who argued against God that was ready to say, be open. Now, believers, you're going to find a lot of closed-minded believers who are not ready to be objectively describe why they believe. But, but believers can be dismissed because they're not using logic. But a scientist and a thinker and a free, a free, a free, a free thinker is following logic. So if he's following logic, why does he not accept that element? So I did find one. Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley. I just, I'll paraphrase because I don't remember the exact language. It's quite eloquent. He writes the following. He was an agnostic, maybe even an atheist. I don't remember what he called himself. So what did he write? What did he write? He wrote the following. I'm invested in the fact that, that, that there should be no God because then I can do it as I wish, especially in the area of sexuality. These are his words. Pretty blunt. And therefore, all my arguments follow that, that my, my first uh, axiom. Now, I was very taken that he wrote that. Why? Because at least he's honest. He's not coming to say, listen, I'm an objective guy, and I'm doing my research, and whatever conclusion I'll accept. No, he's very interested in a particular conclusion, and that's that. <clears throat> now again, this doesn't necessarily say that, we do, that this doesn't prove or disprove God. Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, the Austrian-British philosopher of science, writes famously that a scientific hypothesis has to be able to be... Has to be, able to be uh, the, um, uh, is to be able to be disproven. Not just proven, disproved. If you cannot disprove a, 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 a scientific hypothesis, it's not science. Because science is subject to the rules of proof and disproof. That's why you see theories come and go. Now, some theories uh, withstand the test of time, but a theory is exactly that. It's the best working theory for what we have. And results and other ways of proving it and replicating, etc. And he gives the example. To say that God exists cannot be a scientific statement because no one can disprove it. Whether you can prove it or not, another, but no one can disprove it. That's why even the most radical atheists in their moment, if you ask them, you, are you certain, 100% certain there's no God? They'll never say that, 100% certain. They'll say, I'm also not 100% certain there are no fairies, as Christopher Hitchens, all of Hashalom said. Christopher Hitchens had a Jewish mother. As, as, as uh, the three famous uh, atheists of our time Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, two Jews, and the third one, Richard Dawkins. He's, he's not been yet found to be Jewish. But uh, these are, you know, he wrote, Christopher Hitchens wrote, God is not great. Hitchens had their book, their books on this topic. So Hitchens has said a number of times, before he passed away a few years ago, but he can't, he can't disprove it absolutely. But the, he, the burden of proof lies on those that believe, not those that don't. So this would be called... I, you know, agnostic is someone who's in doubt, no proof either way. Atheist is someone who's almost sure or very sure, and so on. I'm not going to go through every particular level. I once wrote an article about this topic, and I was, remind, and I was uh, rudely reminded by a number of atheists, because I just piled all the atheists together, and they said there are many different, just like there are many types of believers, there are many types of atheists. I alluded to it earlier. There are radical atheists. There are moderate atheists. There are uh, uh, average atheists. So atheism itself has many schools of thought. You know, I think there's American Athe Atheistic Society of America or something like that. So there you can go through, you can check it out online if you happen to be interested in that. So um, going back to the topic at hand, um, so we're left with what? What are we left with there? Now for those that do believe and do accept there's a God, there, comes an, there are those that just do it out of cultural reasons and don't give it much thought, you know? They haven't thought about it too much. But those that have thought about it and have uh, challenged it come to a conclusion 
that if there's indeed in God, that's the only reason we can talk about God, because God himself gave us information and embedded in our DNA ways to understand the Creator. So if so that basically essentially states that there is a, um, uh, a given, that if God created the, the universe, created it with design and purpose, and communicated that design and purpose, or else there'd be no point to existence and creation. And as such, God also revealed to us ways to communicate or ways to understand what God is about. Or in the words of the Bible, God created the human being in the divine image, and therefore we in our own personality, or as the book of Job puts it, from my flesh I behold God, if you study the art and you study the, the, the creation, which is created in the shape and image of the, the, of the creator, then you can get a sense of what the creator is like. And that's going to be part of what I'm going to be discussing shortly in understanding God. But let's do this in a process of elimination, working our way backwards from the bottom up. I mentioned before, we have to determine what does it mean. Before we define what God is, we have to define what means existence. Or I better, better rephrase, what does reality mean? I've discussed this somewhat in my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, in the chapter on God. So some of these ideas, if you want to follow up, you can check it out in that chapter. I'm going to elaborate more than that is there. So I think the first thing that I think an intelligent approach to this has to be is looking at the tools and the, and the logic and reason we use to determine anything. How do we know anything exists? So there were philosophers, I, I, I forget who by name, that argued and could argue, and anyone could argue this, that all of existence is an illusion. Can anybody disprove that? It's impossible to disprove. Because any proof or disproof is part of the illusion. If, for example, like the Matrix showed, that all of existence as we know it is a computer program that somebody is controlling, so anything we come up with, proving or disproving, is all part of that program. So it's a built-in that you can't disprove that existence is an illusion. So how do we come to, the rea to, to accept that existence is a reality and not an illusion? It's just simply, like many other, many other uh, um, axioms, that we just accept it to be that way. I don't know if you know this, but science, especially Karl Popper as well, and uh, more than Karl Popper, also um, Godel, the great mathematician, and similarly Heisenberg in physics, quantum mechanics, made the argument that, and has been accepted now as, as a scientific fact, that science, even with all its logic and reason, always has to have an axioms that are not necessarily based on reason. Even mathematics, which was considered to be the absolute science, everything is provable. So Godel demonstrated in the mid-20th century, which was a very radical, but he proven that even mathematics is based on certain givens that just all mathematicians and all scientists accept. Because every system has to have axioms. And axioms do not necessarily mean they've been reasoned or proven. They're not irrational, but they're not necessarily a proof. I'll give you a, a classic example. It's accepted by all scientists that if you have te several theories to explain phenomenon, you choose the simplest explanation. Nobody knows why. It's just accepted that the simplest theory, the simplest explanation is the one that will be accepted until it's, unless it's disproven. Why? Because scientists, you could say the lo logic works that you try to find the simplest path to answer questions. But someone could say, how do you know? Maybe the most complex answer should be the one. Now, this is not meant to, um, uh, uh, this was the word I want to say, to, to um, uh, discredit the scientific method. It's just meant to be honest about what science is and what it's not. So a real scientist will tell you, a real scientist will tell you, I don't need God to explain much of existence, or maybe all of it. Because I can explain how human beings evolved from apes, that evolved from lower species, all the way back to bacteria to that ball of gas. If you ask me what was before the ball of gas, science has nothing to answer, because we were not there. We have no witnesses. 
and we're trying to figure it out. We have theories. That's what an honest scientist will tell you. Is it possible that God started the whole thing? Yeah. How could I say not? Again, a scientist who does not have any interest in bias or has no preconceived notions. That would be the approach. You could say, you know, I, I can explain much without it, but I can't explain everything without it. But once I use God, the scientists will say, I've gone out of the world of science. We've gone from physics to metaphysics. Okay. That's a fair discussion. So I don't, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't claim that I am an expert in that area. And I uh, only can talk about phenomena that I can relate to or that can be discussed with some type of empirical or other forms of extrapolation that scientists have by consensus agreed to. And that's what we approach it with. <clears throat> but let's go back to the, what I'm saying is, so how do we determine? So the first axiom is that we accept that existence re is real. It's not an illusion. Because if it's an illusion, all our discussions are meaningless. But if it's real, so then, what do we, then what, what, how do we define reality? How would you define reality? So the obvious, as I said, we'll start from the bottom up. The first way you define reality is by saying, my five senses. Since, I, since I've accepted that my eyes, what they see, is real, and it's not an illusion, even though, of course, you can argue we see magicians, sleight of hand, and we could be fooled with optical illusions. But let's, for argument's sake, most things that we see, we can rely on. We all see this white wall. You show it to a million people, they'd all describe it the same way. So that's pretty much strong evidence that there is a white wall here, and that it's white, and that it's shaped so-and-so. Why? Because enough eyes have seen it, and born witness, that is considered to be a fact. That's what we would call a fact. In other words, anything that our senses experience, most of us, I'd say all of us would agree is a fact. Enough people heard a sound, you'll say, okay, I accept that, even if I didn't hear it. If enough people tell us that the George Washington existed a few hundred years ago and there's news accounts and there's enough witnesses and enough books and so on, you don't come to think, oh, there's a conspiracy of 50 people or 100 or 1,000 people that created an illusion called George Washington and they just created forged, forged newspapers and forged books and forged witnesses, false witness, and now we created... We don't say that. Is it possible? Of course it's possible. But there's certain accepted... Um, verification, what we call facts, of enough witnesses, um, testimony from different parties across the board. So this is called the empirical approach. And we'll take questions at the end, you know, because since there's a class and a lot of people, so if you don't mind. Okay, so this is, you have many, uh, the, the, so our senses tell us a certain dimension of reality. But if you, if, if you limit it to that, then comes the question, one second. What about things that the senses don't experience? And I mentioned one before. I mentioned love. Love. You say, I love this person. How can you empirically prove that? All you can say is, I feel love. You know, someone else says, I don't feel it. You know, I believe you that you say it, but I mean, what, why do you measure the reality of this thing called love? How do you measure the reality even of love in general? So clearly you need something more than just senses. Because there's nothing that your eyes, your ears, your taste, touch, and smell can measure in what we call love. So then how do we know? Because we have other senses. We have super sensory tools. Since I know I can love somebody, so I can imagine that you can love somebody. So in a sense, it's through the common human experience that we can identify other realities. Same thing with ideas. Nobody's ever seen an idea. Ideas are, are creations of the mind. But because you come up with ideas, so you can accept that someone else comes up with ideas. Why would you not? So here you have a, a, a next level of experience which is not directly witnessed or experienced with the five senses, but nevertheless is considered to be also factual. Now, how far can you go with, with logic here? So you can go pretty far. Because now, let's talk about, let's say, I just spoke about conscious ideas. What about unconscious Conscious ideas, as I said, you can experience through common human experience. But what about unconscious? How do we know there's an unconscious? And the answer is because logic dictates that if conscious mind is aware of certain ideas as we speak right now, and you know that you have many more ideas inside your mind that you're not conscious of, you have to say that your brain contains many other ideas that you're not aware of at this moment. 
We also know that human life, life experiences as children become embedded in our personalities. So any type of trauma that we experience or any type of positive thing affects our behavior later. That's not a conscious thing. That's what is called unconscious. Now, no one has ever seen the unconscious, but you can extrapolate what is called in the, in the in Torah language, Yediyah Sashlila, which means you can't see it directly, but you can, you can um, infer or call extrapolate, extrapolate instead of interpolation, there's extrapolation, that it exists. The black hole is a perfect example in physics of extrapolation. There are scientists and physicists that deny that there's a, the concept of a black hole, or what they call today black matter, black energy, dark energy, and so on. Because no one can see black, a black hole. By definition, it's black. How do we know it exists? So the theory goes like this, because when you see areas, large areas in space that are, work, that are behaving erratically and are moving about in ways and you can't explain why they would be moving that way. So the theory that first Einstein posited and then he actually retracted and then came back to it is that there must be a body there of, that's exerting such a powerful gravity that's affecting the movement of anything that comes in its proximity. But no one's seen those bodies. You just see their effect. So, for example, if there was a, I was holding a magnet, right, on this side of a, a wall. You can't see me or the magnet. But you see on the other side of the wall metal pieces moving around strangely. So you can extrapolate and say, you know what? There must be something exerting energy that's causing an erratic movement of metal. So you, you can extrapolate and say and infer there must be somewhere a magnet, even though you can't see it. And applying it psychologically to the unconscious, you could see, for example, a trained psychologist, therapist. I'm talking about a good one. There are many bad ones, but talking about a good one. Would be, what do they see that others don't see? You go to a trained person who's able to talk to you, able to have a conversation, and they can come away with somewhat of an understanding of your psyche that another person does not come away with. What is it that they have? Is it an instinct? Is it an intuition? Is it something you could be trained? So one of the ways to understand it, yes, there's no clearly some people simply understand human beings better or may have experienced themselves certain experiences in life so making them more empathetic and can relate to other people who've had trauma or pain and so on. So one of the ways to explain it is the following. Like when you go to a physical doctor, medical doctor, and let's say you have a pain in your arm, or a pain elsewhere, God forbid. So the doctor will ask some questions, then may give, examine you, and come away with, uh, like, you know, let's say you have pain in your right arm. Okay, touch here, touch here. Ah, and you start saying, oh, that's where it hurts. And he tries and feels it out, and gets a sense, if needs, need be, to take an x-ray, or CAT scan, or another or a sonogram, or something else, to try to understand what are the causes that the, phys the physical eye, the, phys the naked eye cannot see. So the trained physician, knowing human anatomy, have, having experience, can pretty much identify, not always, but can identify uh, from symptoms, causes that most of us are not trained, cannot. No different than, for example, people who are very experienced in business can forecast certain things, not because they're prophets, because their experience has taught them to look for certain signs that the average novice cannot see. Anyone with a level of expertise, whatever area it is, is going to see things that the novice cannot see. You know, you look at it, it'll look like random. Someone else will see a pattern. The same thing is psychologically. A person who's trained can ask the right questions and can have a discussion and can learn from that much about your psyche more than you yourself may be even willing to share. Because they know how, to, how, you, how you respond. You study body language. For example, most of us, the areas where, where there's a lot of pain, psychic pain, meaning personal pain, psychological pain, we avoid. We don't like to discuss it. Just like you avoid touching something where there's a raw nerve, a tender nerve. So a trained person who's asking questions suddenly sees, for example, you don't want to talk about your mother. And you say, is everything all right with your mother? Yeah, perfect. We have a great relationship. So let's talk about it. And if you see resistance, you can pretty much extrapolate there's something going on there. Now, I'm not talking about in any way an assault or anything that crosses boundaries and trying to, uh, you know, um, they try to find out about someone's life without their cooperation. I'm talking about a trained person will do it gently and, and sensitively. 
So think of it, this is the way I always put it, is like think of an imaginary wall shrouded in darkness. And you can't touch this wall, and you can't shine a light on it. But you want to know what it looks like. Is it a straight wall? Is it a jagged wall? Is it a broken wall? What options do you have to be able to figure out what the wall? You can't touch it. You can't see it. And you can't shine a light on it. So here's one option. You take a, a rubber ball and you bounce it against the wall. And you see how it bounces back to you. If it bounces straight, you know that's a straight area in the wall. And you keep bouncing the ball again and again and again. And you can get something like a sonar. Sonars that pick up the entire topography of, let's say, the ocean bed, even though no one's gone there, but the sonar gives you back signals that you can identify the contours and the shape and form of something. So the same thing is here. By having a conversation with someone and seeing how they react, with enough conversations, you can get yourself somewhat of a picture of what the psyche looks like. Not an entire picture, and it's not always perfect, but someone who's trained can get that sense. So here you have a new tool that's not interpolation. It's not empirically observable or experienced through the five senses. It's not experienced through common experience, like I said before about love and ideas, and it's because it's the unconscious, but clearly other evidence has brought you to come to conclusions that there's something there and you can figure out somewhat of what it may look like. This is essentially, by the way, how the, the, the physicists see the, subatomic, the atomic and subatomic world. You know, the, an atom has never been seen by the human race. There's no person that can see subatomic particles. Because, and there's no instrument, even the strongest electron microscopes cannot see subatomic particles. They're just too microscopic. But you could see their effect. You see their impact. You know, that model that we learned in high school, that, that, uh, that atoms look like a... Like a like a bunch of grapes, with, uh, with uh, neutrons being white and protons being black and electrons looking like a, uh, like a, like a, like a, f a field of energy, that's simply a working model to make, allow us to work with something. No one, has ever, no one knows if items look that way at all. So there's a lot of imagery we get that doesn't mean it means it looks like that. It's something just to work with so you can understand. But there's no question that they're subatomic particles. So who was it? I think it was Sir Arthur... Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, maybe, I forgot his name. One of the physicists in the mid-20th century, early 20th century, was asked the classic question, if no one has ever seen subatomic particles, how can you come to these bizarre, and they called it bizarre, spooky world of quantum mechanics. It's called spooky physics, even till this day, because its conclusions were all counterintuitive. Whereas in Newtonian physics, for example, Everything is defined by classic physics of cause and effect. The billiard ball effect. So the billiard ball effect is what? That when you hit a billiard, if you hit with a cue, you hit a ball this way, you, every time you'll hit it this way on that angle, it will always have the impact on the next ball the same way. This predictable, deterministic universe. This is the way physics was seen all the way till the beginning, or the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Then came Einstein with the theory of special relativity and relativity, and then later quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr and Heisenberg and the others, and determined that in the microscopic universe, not macroscopic, in the microscopic universe, there's a whole new reality that is absolutely indeterministic, states of probability, these are their words, where you cannot determine certain things. And it was adamantly fought by Einstein himself, said, it doesn't make sense. One of, the words he, one of the lines he used when he spoke to Niels Bohr about it was, God does not play dice with the universe. Everything is predictable. Everything is logical. And Niels Bohr purportedly responded, don't tell God what to do. Very similar to what I said earlier in this class, that if God is the one that determines whether it's deterministic or not. Not we do. And Einstein, until his last days, even though he had to admit certain conclusions, was very disturbed by this type of approach because it was not logical, seemingly. So Arthur Eddington, I think it was, was asked, how can you come to such bizarre conclusions? For example, is light a wave or a particle? So any physicist will tell you it depends. It can be both, it could be neither. It depends who measures it and when they measured it. Because in Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, without going into deep physics here, states that the velocity and position of an atom 
cannot be determined at the same time. And therefore, the one who measures it creates from an indeterministic state a deterministic one. Schrodinger's cat you may have heard of. I mean, many other examples that are very counter-logical. Yet, but they've been proven too many times for science to deny, and that's why it's accepted facts today. A number of years ago, there was a book called The Most Reliable Machine on Earth is based on the most unreliable rule. Computers are the most reliable machine, and it's based on the uncertainty principle, which allows us to manipulate subatomic particles based on quantum mechanics. So he gave this analogy. How can you come to such conclusions by things you've never seen? And his his analogy was with a fisherman who spread his net across the seas and gathered up all the types of fish, documented it, documented the different species, different colors, different shapes, different sizes, and then came to a master conclusion. What was that? That there are no fish in the sea that are shorter than a half inch long. And he's ready to make an announcement. His little daughter hears he's about to make this announcement. She says to him, what what does the net look like? Let's see the net that you use to capture the fish. She looked at the net, and he looks at the net. The net had spaces in the ropes that were half inch wide and long. So obviously all the fish that were shorter than a half inch long fell back into the water. So this great scientist was about to make a conclusion which would have been accurate, but his conclusion should have, should have included one simple thing. If you use a net that has half spaces, half inch spaces in, in the ropes, you're never going to catch fish that are shorter than a half inch long. But you don't need a scientist to know that. Everyone can figure that out. His analogy was, what tools are you using? If you want to use a net with half inch, you're going to only fa- find fish that are longer than half inch. If you want to experience things that you can see with the naked eye, then you'll see certain things in reality. If you want to experience something that's seen by a microscope, then you see that. You need different type of tools to experience and know subatomic particles and their movement and how they function. Which, of course, tells you that something that is very, very, in a way, unsettling. Because human beings love to worship their own logic. Suddenly, your logic is not good enough. Because your logic, just like, the, your, just like your instruments, are limited. They're limited by your logic. So initially, it almost seems like undermining our entire processes. Because then you can't rely on your logic, you can't rely on reason, you can't rely on empirical proof, you can't rely even on extrapolation. So what are you relying on? The answer is maybe you have other tools that you just have not yet accessed. Just like let's go back to love. You know, many people who are very, very cerebral and big brains have difficulty with relationships, with emotional relationships. Because they may be intellectually intelligent, but they're not emotionally intelligent. And when you tell them, you know, you're very book smart, but you have no common sense. You're very brilliant, but you don't know how to emote. You don't know how to be vulnerable. And many of them will look at you and say, I don't know what you're talking about. I've tested this a number of times. What's going on? They have to- tools, they have their tools, and that works for them. And they have never developed the tools of emotion. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean it's not capable. It means that they're, they're not ready to go there. So how intellectually honest is that? You're ready to go only into the meadows and the horizons that you are comfortable with. The first sign of intelligence is that you're ready to embrace something that may be something you're not comfortable with. If comfort is the ultimate dis- 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 the arbiter and decision maker in finding truth, you can imagine what our truths are going to look like. So the, mere, the mere fact that we talk about God, it really is challenging our tools. Because like I go back to the initial points, the initial points that I made, the questions I asked were not meant just to be questions. It was meant to show that you're talking about God as if God is another reality, like, like uh, let's say, uh, a sunset or something you can observe or at least experience with supersensory tools if subatomic particles can be experienced with any instrument that we know of and you need to have different type of tools to relate to it what about God and do we have the instruments to relate to a God so let's talk about going so we're going further and further so far I've said you know reality can be defined by empirical tools which is the senses it can be defined by intellectual and emotional tools. It can be defined by extrapolation, process of elimination, and, the, and determining there must be something behind the curtain, even though I can't see it. Like I said, the invisible wall that I described. 
and you can keep on extrapolating. For example, if I were to ask any of people, uh, anyone here, beyond subatomic particles, what's be, what, how far down the rabbit hole can we go? Are there sub subatomic, sub 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 sub? An intelligent person today would say, I have no clue. My logic actually would dictate that it's probably an endless road. Because why should it stop? Just because I don't know, I haven't seen it. It would be like someone climbing and saying, okay, what does the horizon look like? You're standing on the ground. And you'll describe the horizon. And then someone will say, okay, go up, about 10, to go, go up let's say, 100 to 1,000 feet up on a mountain. What does it look like now? Oh, different description. Now, go up 10,000 feet. What does it look like now? A different description. Let's say hypothetical is a mountain that goes 100,000 feet up. Today people went landed on the moon. What did they see? Earth has a completely different look. What does all this tell you? That the more you know, you more, the know, more you know how much there is more to know. And that does not minimize our knowledge. Using the words of Rabbi Yosef Alba in the book called Sefer Ikrim. It's called the book of uh, foundation, the book of, of fundamentals. He says, Tachas hayedia shaloy neida. The ultimate of knowledge is to know that you don't know. Now that doesn't dismiss what you know. It, on the contrary, it enhances it. And then there's an interpretation, the ultimate of knowledge is to know the unknowable. Whether this is an urban legend or not, I don't know, but in 1898, the, 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 goes, the, the word goes around, you can look it up online, there's an argument whether it ever happened or not, no one can determine, it doesn't matter. The point is this, that the, the U.S. patent, the, uh, the, the head of the U.S. patent office, the, the U, head officer of the U.S. patent office, the one that issues patents and for inventions and so on, f uh, resigned, saying in 1898 that everything that could be invented has been invented and there's no purpose for him to keep his job. He could close down the department. Okay. This, remember, was in the height of the Industrial Revolution, Electricity was discovered. The steam engine was discovered. The turbine was discovered. Industrialization was going full force. Most of, for example, the New York's infrastructure was built 100 years ago. The subway system, the bridges. So it was pretty great feats that still stand. And we can still marvel. So it was not surprising that he came to the conclusion everything that could be invented has been invented. Now, mind you, 1898 is pre-Einstein pre-quantum mechanics, pre-atomic and nuclear revolution, pre-computer and information age, and pre-everything we know, including the internet and all, so on and so forth. Now, would anyone today, 100 and whatever, 10 years later, 115 years later, say, you know what, everything that could be created has been invented? On, on the contrary. With all that's happened the last 100 years, we know that we haven't even tipped the, scratched the surface. So more knowledge has taught us that there's much more that we'll ever know. Take the human body. The human body is a little box, five, six feet tall, 100, 200 pounds. We won't go higher than that. Sometimes a little more. And very small compared to outer space, compared even to the ocean. And yet, how much do we know about this human body? So we know much. Longevity, age expectancy is double from 1920s. I think it was 44, 45 then. Now it's almost 80. For a woman, a little higher. Medical breakthroughs. The, the, uh, uh, elimination of diseases that killed so many. So no one argues that medicine and medical miracles are... But ask a, an honest, objective, humble doctor. The best. What do we know about the human body? What do we know about the, the world of infertility? What about the brain? The brain, the size of the palm of my hand, a little bigger. Whatever we know, everyone knows that there's so much more that we... It's a complete mystery, usually. That doesn't mean we can't do many things, but it means that our tools that we've had till now are limited, and there are many more other tools. So now let's talk about God. Let's talk about God now. I, went back, I go back to the question. If all this I've said now, and this does not require any faith, does not require any belief, does not require any religion, everything I've said till now. It requires simple intelligence, dictates that there's more, more down the rabbit hole, as I said, beneath the surface, much, much more. And if there's an unconscious, there's definitely an ununconscious, and it goes on and on and on. So then, why is it when it comes to God, are we so simplistic? 
and not applying the same type of intelligence. Here we're talking the possibility. I, I say possibility only because I accept it as a God, but I only say it to satisfy the objective inquiry here. So if the possibility that a God exists would mean that there's a creator that put all this in place, and all this complexity, as deep as it goes, has something even deeper that when you cut to the core, you'll find that highest reality called the divine source of it all. That's so illogical. I don't find that illogical at all. I mean, even people who have, don't have belief in faith took some psychedelics, and they all came back with the same conclusion that there's some higher force behind it all. You know how many people came to believe in God because of LSD? Or because of some other hallucinogens and other uh, uh, psychedelic experiences? I'm not suggesting that's a proof. But I'm suggesting if hundreds of thousands and thousands of people came to realize, what they come to realize? That which any logic can tell you, that there's a lot more going on beneath this, behind the scenes. As a matter of fact, that's far more real than what we see. So if I were to ask you now a question, I started out the process of elimination working our way from the bottom up, what we see with our eyes. Now that we know what we know scientifically, and I'm not even discussing God for a moment, what is more real, the subatomic particles that shape everything in existence or the, or the objects that we see with our eyes? I'll put it this way, the DNA in your body or the physical body that you have that you see in the mirror? The answer is obvious. What you see is just the surface level tip of the iceberg. Just because you're comfortable with it and you see it all the time doesn't mean that is the most real aspect. It's like saying, what's more real, the symptom or the cause? The symptom you see. Someone said, I have a toothache, I have a headache. Yeah, obviously you feel it and you know it, it's very real. But what is real? The toothache or what's causing the toothache to take? And the cause is always invisible. Or not always, most of the time. So what you conclude from this is a very interesting um, reverse hypothesis. And that is that the more visible it is, maybe the less real it is. And the more invisible it is, the more real it is. So in other words, reality is not defined by us. It's defined by the causes that shape us. And we know clearly that everything in existence has causes. That's the whole basis of science. So even though no one's ever seen gravity, but you see the impact of gravity. So clearly gravity is a force. Electromagnetism, the other two, nuclear strong force, the weak force. These are energies you've never seen. Has, have you ever seen electricity? But you sure know it exists. You touch, God forbid, a, a live wire, you're going to feel it. You look at appliances, you look at the world lit up, alive, energized, something's energizing it. But what does electricity look like? Can you tell me? I know the images we have, looks like lightning bolts, we envision it as some type of flow, but it's not subject to the senses. But it's undeniable, and we can generate it, and we can regulate it, and we can control it. Where does water come from? You ever think about water? So we know the water that comes into our houses do not originate in the pipes, obviously. Right? They originate, the pipes are, are pumping water from arteries, main, water mains, that lie under the ground. Right? Where do those water mains lead you to reservoirs? that can be hundreds of miles away. New York's reservoirs are hundreds of miles from here. They, they, they gather water through rainwater and other sources. Okay? But where does the water come from? In the, where does rainwater come from? So, okay, so rainwater is, can be traced to the seas, to the evaporation that creates the clouds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And where do the seas get their water from? So that goes back to under, deep under the ground of the seas, you have the sources of springs, live springs, that come from the center of the earth, which, by the way, is complete fire and lava, everything antithetical to water. Can you explain how the, it's the, the, or how the belly of the earth, which is, which is heat that's comparable to the heat of the sun and creating volcanic eruptions, is causing water to come when water is... So the answer is that once it cools off, the lava turns into water, whatever, all the different theories. But how many of us have even traced it all the way back to the source? You know, we trace it, we know, you know, we're pretty happy if you get water, bottled water or water coming out of your faucet with a filter, no filter, that's about it. I'm just trying to point out how we are really very superficial people. And I conclude myself. We, we worship what we see. We're seduced by our senses. You can hear every truth in the world. 
and you're standing outside and a beautiful woman walks by or another sight, you will be attracted by it. It doesn't matter what you're thinking about. Because we are people of senses. We are sensory creatures who value what we see, what we hear, we taste, touch, and smell. We would not have a trillion dollar advertising industry or a billion dollar advertising industry and everyone vying for our attention in one way or another if it didn't have power. We're hypnotized by this world. Let's be honest. So obviously the roots of things and the sources of things may intrigue us. You know, everybody wants to know what makes a clock tick. We all like to take things apart, but with a limit. So the search for God is actually the greatest search in history because you're searching for the root of it all. And the people who seriously search for it, starting from Abraham, they never stopped. This is what I describe now at length is basically Abraham's journey. He grew up in a home, a pagan home, in a pagan world. You know what they worshipped? They worshipped idols. They worshipped gods that they could see. Maimonides has a fascinating introduction to the laws of idolatry in his book Mishneh Torah that describes how did people become idol worshippers. And his answer, is, the way he explains it is, is brilliant. It's fascinating. That initially Adam and Eve knew there was some invisible force, reality that put everything here. But then human beings felt uncomfortable with looking for invisible because we want something visible. So they began to attribute to stars. That's why it's called star worship. Excuse me, Kechov Mamazolas. Because stars, they didn't say stars are God. They said stars are God's handiwork. They're God's instruments. And they began to identify with stars. But stars are very far away. So they began to identify with trees and objects on earth that they said correspond to different constellations and stars. And then came the next level of the, the, the what do we call it, the con artists and the charlatans who said, you know what, people are worshiping that. Let's create a building around certain trees and around certain objects and we'll sell entrance fee. We'll make some money on it. And here slowly, generation by generation evolved instead of accepting that the source of it all is invisible and beyond you, we want to have a god or some type of deity that we can relate to. A tree, a sun, a moon, other objects. So it didn't begin foolishly someone's going to just bow down to a stone or to a tree. These became symbols of God's hand. But then the symbols became God and God was forgotten. Comes Abraham and his intelligence, even as a child, recognizes there's no way that all these objects, which are just like me and you, and they're mortal and they will die and they're subject to all the, the, the erosion and the f f effects of a mortal universe, can be the source of it all. Like I said earlier, this... The world does not dictate that it's a source. So he came to start extrapolating. So where is it? He looked, went out to the meadows, looked up to the heavens. First he said the sun, the moon. No, but the sun and moon are just extension of this universe. The sun sets, the moon sets. He realized they're all the same limited. And then he came to the big realization that took him many years to come to realize. That's the other way around. He's looking for God. He's looking for God on his terms. He realized he has to stop looking. Shut down all your senses and God will emerge. That's what he came to realize. Because as I said earlier, the part cannot dictate what the whole is like. How could a creature discover the creator? You can extrapolate, you can figure out there must be something, but how could you relate to the creator? Only by shutting down his own tools. So think of this way. Shut down your senses. Your sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. What are you going to be left with? So initially the thought may be, Daunting, maybe frightening. You think you disappear. You won't disappear. You'll be left with yourself. That's not f shaped by and defined by senses. When's the last time you tried that? Try it out. You, know, you can't try it out right now because you need to. Because if you want to hear what I'm going to say, you can't shut your sound. But try it out. Just a total silence where you have all your senses shut down, if possible. You're going to start hearing yourself, a voice within. Abraham came to realize if he wants to find God, he has to allow God to find him. He has to shut down, which we call humility, complete silence. Instead of aggressively trying to find God like we find other things in life, like finding a loaf of bread or finding an answer to our problem, realize, let me shut everything down, and the essence of it all, the core of it all, will emerge. And that's when he first discovered God. Or you could say God discovered him. 
And that was the relationship. So what are we talking about now? What kind of entity is this? We can't use human tools to, this, to define the entity called the divine, but we could extrapolate. And we can shut down our tools and then discover realities that we never thought are possible. Actually, quantum mechanics is a very good example for this type of stuff. Because it's when you shut down your conventional logical tools is when you come to realize there are other type of realities that you would not have seen otherwise. So it comes down to this, using now the Maimonides term, he describes, he says, God. Well, before I go there, let me just say the following. So Richard Dawkins and the other atheists, their big statement, everyone always asks like this. Okay, you say nothing can create itself. Fine. That means God, there's a God that created everything. If nothing can create itself, then who created God? That's the next question they always ask. So everything has a cause, fine. We have parents, our parents had parents. Everything in this world evolved from one, real, from one a state of being, another state of being, another state of being. But then who created the first state of being? God? So who created God? You just said nothing can create itself. This is the brilliant argument of atheists. Now if you think about it for a few minutes, you realize that the response is very obvious. Obviously, if you're just carrying over the question from uh, objects to God, and God is just another extension of us, of course, then the question is, who created God? But the real conclusion, this is what Abraham came to, and now I'm using Maimonides' words, is that God is, no, is a reality, an existence that's like none other. If God is an existence like ours, then obviously something had to create it as well, because nothing can exist on its own. And therefore you have the expressions, three main expressions that describe as best as possible, the one is Maimonides' words, that God is a built in nimtza, which means a non-existential existence. Let me explain. It means you, can't, you cannot say God exists because then you would suggest that God exists like we exist. You can't say God does not exist, so you say God exists but not in an existence that we can even conceive of. So we exist because we manifest in certain ways. Like I said earlier, if I told you that there's a white wall right here, all you need to do is come and look at it. But what happens if I told you there's a white wall outside? You have to believe it's true. Maybe it's not. You would need proof for it to exist. A non-existential existence doesn't need proof because proof itself is created by that non-existential existence. So in other words, what we can extrapolate is that a creator would be nothing like we are. So anything we're subject to, which includes having a cause, means the, 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 the creator would have no cause. Or as another expression that's used, mitsuyusei matsmuse. His cause is himself. He causes his own existence. His existence is a result of his being. By us, it's the other way around. Our being is a result of our existence. His existence is a result of his reality. So what does that reality mean? It means it's real, not because it's provable, not because it's witnessed, it's real because it's real. Or to use the words that God said to Moses when he asked him, tell me your name, he said, Eye, asher eye, I am who I am. Which of course is cryptic, what does that mean? Maimonides defines it, it means I am because I am. Nothing is because it is. Everything is because something put it there. So in effect what we discover is, that the truth is you cannot say God exists. Because exists is meant in terms, when we say exists, it means either empirical existence, extrapolated existence, perceived existence by, due to common experience, or the other ways I described earlier, some tool. An existence that just exists because it's real is not something that is in our scope. But we can extrapolate and we can figure it out by saying since we exist and our existence must be dependent on something, then the one who put it here must be existence that's not dependent on anything. And in that process, you can learn a lot about what God is like. And above all, is because that type of non-existential existence actually embedded within us um, different elements that we can also sense. It. I'm going to give you an example. I don't know if everyone's following. Maybe I'm going over my own head and over everybody's head here. But let me say this. You know, we've, we value consciousness a lot. You know, if someone says, I'm conscious of something, I'm aware of something, it's considered a compliment, right? Whereas if someone says, I'm not aware, or the person is unaware or clueless, it's usually not a compliment. But I'm going to try to suggest that consciousness is actually not a positive, it's a negative. 
When you're conscious of something, it suggests duality. There's you and the thing you're conscious of. True experience is one that is so seamless and so much in the zone that you're not conscious that it's happening. And I'll give an example. Here. What is your left foot doing right now? So until I mentioned that, you weren't even thinking about it. You weren't conscious of it. But it was alive and it was functioning. Now that you're thinking about your left foot, does that make you make it more real? Or on the contrary, it makes it less real. Because let's say, what does health feel like? Someone says, what does it feel like to be healthy? If you can describe what it feels like, you probably need a doctor. Because health is not supposed to feel like anything. You know, you know, you know, it's not supposed to feel the blood rushing through your veins and arteries. Not, your heart shouldn't be felt. Health is a, is a silent, uh, hel- a real healthy person is a seamless, silent experience. So sensation and consciousness is actually a little superimposed. Do you think, for example, you, know, you put a dry hand in water, so the dry hand gets wet. But does wetness get wet? Wetness is wet. So when we learn knowledge, we learn information. So before I was ignorant, now I'm aware of something. That alone indicates a type of superimposed experience. But when someone becomes completely integrated with knowledge, you become the knowledge itself. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced what's called being in the zone. As a writer, I can tell you, and as athletes tell this to you, that there's being in the zone. What's in the zone? That you're so immersed in what you're doing, you don't realize that you're doing it. You completely forget about yourself. You don't realize what time it is. You don't realize if you're hungry or tired. You're just just like a channel. Everybody vies for that type of state. It doesn't always come. You'll hear it especially with experienced athletes. You've ever seen, for example, let's say, the bottom of the ninth in a baseball game of the seventh game of the World Series. Or the final points in a, a championship tennis match. You know, even watching it, your, your hands tremble. Imagine the person who's playing. How can they have that composure? Because years and years of conditioning and training prepare you for the moment that when you're in that type of state and you have the experience, you just get into that zone and you don't even feel what you're doing. Obviously, you're working with everything, that, all your instincts. But that is considered to be the most powerful experience in life. Love is that way. Right? The deepest levels of sexual or love ecstasy is where you lose yourself and you lose your identity. Why? Because you're no longer thinking about it. You're compl- the subject and the object melt into one. So Jewish thought, when it talks about, for example, Chet Sadas, the tree of knowledge, what happened when they ate from the tree of knowledge? They became conscious of themselves. Self-consciousness was born. Imagine a life where you're not self-conscious. Newborn children, young children, they're not conscious, not of their sexuality, not of themselves. They're just, they just what they call to just be. Not to do, but just be. State of being. That type of comfortable, being comfortable in your own skin, where instead of doing or acquiring, instead of a verb, you're like a noun, is the ultimate experience. Why am I saying this? Because this is a little taste of what the reality of what God is like. Everything in this world that we have is always, you know, we're, I'm, I'm reaching to this, I'm trying to find out that. You're trying to discover things. But there's a reality where it does not have necessarily any shape or form and not even a feeling. There's no sensation when you're in that type of zone. Like I said, when your body is alive, even if you're not conscious of what your left leg or right leg is doing, it's there. Who says consciousness is what defines things? This, in a way, is an expression, an experience that is somewhat of the way the divine uh, essence works. It's not defined by experiences, it's defined by being. It's the ultimate state of being. Now, I know some of what I'm saying may be abstract or complex, or maybe, uh, maybe it sounds gibberish to you, but I'm just trying to give a taste of some of the discussions, some of the more complicated discussions about the nature of God, quote-unquote nature. Really coming to realize that the opportunity to meet God, the opportunity to understand what God is like, is really an opportunity to get beyond our limited horizons and come to realize that a reality that, that defines this reality is very, very different than ours. And in effect, when a person comes to that, they come to embrace uh, truths and eternity that is very different than what our lives are like. Our lives, as I said, are defined by our experiences 
by what we see, we hear, taste, touch, and smell, our needs, the perceived uh, things we consider to be, give us value, and that's through acquiring things, wealth, possessions, and so on. In truth, reality is just the fact that you are. It doesn't require anything. It's just the peace to be at peace that you are. This is a divine reality. But we are a created reality. And as a created reality, everything is shaped and defined by limited experiences. So in a sense, in a strange way, when an atheist says, I don't believe that God exists, or God does not exist, I should say, in a way the atheist is truer than the believer that says God exists. Because when you say God exists, you're saying a God that exists on your terms. What we call existence, just like this table exists, God exists on a more sublime level. When someone says God does not exist, even though they may not mean that, but what they're really saying is that God does not exist the way we exist. Now, I believe that if you're able to define God in new ways, like Levi Yitzhak Baditchever said, if you define God not in the way that was usually defined, like most people's knee-jerk and, and immediate reaction is a juvenile image of God. What is God? God is like this man sitting on a white, on a big throne in heaven with a long white beard or no beard, whatever, and strikes us with lightning when we misbehave. You know, this is the God most people um, accept. Some type of like God that punishes the judge, the, the one who watches everything. You know, this is the God that we're taught in many religious schools and environments. That is a very juvenile God, and such a God, maybe Levitsa, but Ditchva and other believers would say, that if that's the God you believe in, I also am an atheist. So when a person says they're an atheist or agnostic, it could very well be the God that they grew up with, they don't believe in. When Nietzsche said God is dead, and the joke goes, Nietzsche said God is dead, and God said Nietzsche is dead. But when Nietzsche said God is dead, he, was, he didn't mean God is dead. He says the God that was taught to us was never alive in the first place. We just discovered that he was dead. We discovered he was never alive. But if you were to define God as being the root of all roots, that if you cut to the core of all reality, you come to a reality that is beyond the reality we are aware of, that's a far different definition that many people would say, that is intriguing, and I would embrace a concept like that. And you may not even need the word belief, actually, when it comes to that. Because it's really a logical process of realizing that it can't be that we're God, and it can't be our parents are God, even if they felt they were, and it can't be that the parents of our parents, it can't be the cause of the cause of the cause. So you come to realize that the cause of it all must be something that's completely different reality, and then you begin to taste what God really is and the value of God. Because who needs a God anyway that's just another extension of us? What is the point then? Then it's just replacing, instead of worshipping myself, I'm worshipping something else that's like me that put me here. The whole idea is to come to realize that there's a reality that's very different than we are. And it's not just that God is eternal and we are temporary. And God is immortal and we are mortal. God is a different type of reality which dictates that he's etern that dictates eternity and, immortal and immortality. And we are a reality that dictates mortality and, and temporary and impermanence. Now, of course, it needs a lot more elaboration of understanding this type of reality, but... The first step is to not worship yourself. Don't think you have it figured out. That's the first step in really coming to understand what God really is like. And in that sense, as I said, an atheist who says there is no God or God does not exist, the God that you've taught me doesn't exist, may be saying the deepest truth of all. It's exactly right. That's not the God you want. You need a different type of God or a different definition. And in that sense, if you get that definition... You may discover that atheists are not atheists and agnostics are not agnostic. You know, I'll add, throw more one, th one more point into this. In the th Talmud, there's a very strange Talmud that says that Moses, when he was up on the mountain, and God was showing, reading with him the Bible, Torah. So in the beginning of the Torah, it says, we shall create man in the divine image. When Moses saw the word we, he said to God, there's only one God. Why is there a we here? Nasa. We suggest duality, which is going to allow people to think that there's more than one God, which is, of course, antithetical to the whole principle of God as one, which means really not only there's monotheism as one God, but one reality. So God's response was, 
The ones who want to make a mistake, let them make a mistake. What kind of answer is that? Why would you put a word into the Torah that allows people to interpret it in the wrong way? But there's a deeper meaning behind this. It means that God created an agnostic universe. And the Arizal, the Holy Arizal explains it this way, that for independent reality like ours to emerge, that you and I can be sitting right now in this room and speak to each other as if we're self-contained individuals. And in our feeling, we feel like we're self-made even. Logic dictates you, that you had parents. Logic may dictate that God created it all. But what do you feel? You feel like you're an extension of someone else? You feel you're, you're invulnerable and, uh, and you're here. That's it, I'm here to stay. Logic tells you that it's not that way. But you're emotionally, you feel I'm here. So that reason explains it's a result of God having to con concealing his presence. For us to be able to have an independent consciousness, independent individual ego, God concealed his presence to allow us to have our presence. It would be if, as if you have a dominant leader, a dominant teacher, who completely encompasses everything, there'd be no room for anyone to emerge. So God conceals his presence, which essentially means creates an agnostic universe where those that want to make a mistake can make a mistake. That's part of the plan. The part of the plan is that it is a concealment. Go back to Christopher Hitchens. A few days before he died, or a few weeks, he was asked by a journalist, since you're such an atheist, what happens after you die, you discover there is a God? So his answer was, I'll ask him, why did he conceal himself so well? I would say a pretty good answer for an atheist. Which means, if you think about it, that he accepted the concept to everyone, that maybe God actually did create this whole thing, but he concealed himself so well that you can convince yourself, or you can determine that, you don't need a, that there's no proof, and therefore maybe God doesn't exist. Maybe that itself God put into place. Now, of course, that throws a whole monkey wrench into this, because then that would say that actually every time we have doubts, that may be exactly what God did. And what are you going to do? If, if the Creator cloaked Himself and shrouded Himself and not allowed you to see Him, or it, whatever, then what? So here the Kabbalah and Hasidic thought gives a whole eloquent explanation that though God did conceal and create an agnostic universe, but he didn't create an airtight agnostic universe. There is the ability to pierce the darkness, the black hole, the tzimtzum, and bring light. And that's why you see people making choices where they say, you know what? I may not see God, and I may not be able to prove it absolutely, but I know that there's something there. And because I know there's something there, I commit my life to goodness and kindness, to live a divine life, not to give in to the, the temptation to not be accountable and not be responsible, even though that may be more comfortable, and to live even though I cannot see, but I can sense there's something beyond. And by living that way, that's how you pierce the darkness. That itself is how we bring God into the picture. And that's why the Medrash says on this verse that my holiness, God says, is dependent on yours. Because I can't be holy unless you acknowledge me. That's the way I bound myself to this world. I've concealed myself well enough that it's you that has to bring me to the surface. And I will not do it. Because if I do it, then it loses the whole purpose of us being independent entities. So that's how Jewish thought, mystical thought, really explains the fact that this is an agnostic universe and it's very, and it's very easy for us to deny God. Or even if you claim you're a believer, to live a life that isn't always consistent to your beliefs. Why? Because the beliefs are in your mind and in your emotions and heart. What dominates? The reality of this material universe. But there's a deep sense in our souls, being that the soul originates from God, that there's something more. And for some of us, it's more than just something more. It's really coming to a journey, a, a journey and a search, like Abraham, to come to realize that not only there, that there's something more, but that more is a reality very different than our own. And that's what I want to connect to because that's real. I want to be able to recognize and come to an experience that is real because it's real, not because it's real based on my empirical and other observations. No, is we don't want a God created in the human image. We want a human created in the divine image, which is what Abraham came to discover. We want to recognize that we are, want to be part of the whole, not that the whole should be 
an extension of ourselves. And that's ultimately when we say we worship or we serve God, which is, you know, could be a turn off. What do you mean serve God? Why serve God? I want to serve myself. You're not serving God as a, as, as, as a slave to a master. You're serving a reality that's higher than your own. And in effect, what's, what, come, what you get in return is you become an extension of that. So we have two choices in life. You can be dedicated to yourself and your needs. Then great, okay, you'll achieve as much as your needs and your, uh, and, and your demands um, require. Or you can dedicate your life to a cause greater than yourself. And if that cause greater than yourself is eternal and immortal and real because it's real and non-existential existence, then you become an extension of that eternity and that immortality. So the interesting twist is that when you lose yourself, you surrender your ego and your sense of, um, uh, sense of control of what you think matters and what you think is real, and you surrender that to something r- r- much realer than yourself, which we call God, you then begin to be an extension and experience what that higher reality is like. That's what happens. Now, I have to share this. Years ago, when I started this class, I, um, uh, the people coming were from the arts and entertainment industry, many, who, have, who are uh, spiritual, but not from a traditional Jewish sense. Many would say their spirituality came from Zen Buddhism or LSD and so on. So it's very interesting um, conversations we used to have. But I came from a perspective of traditional and mystical Judaism, and they were coming from their experiences. Their Judaism was limited to very empty and superficial bar mitzvah and bar mitzvah lessons, and that was that. And many Jews, you know, 60%, I think, of Buddhists in America are Jewish. Well, the reason is simple. They don't find it in Judaism. They, Jews are seekers. And Buddhism has very many similarities to Jewish mysticism. Most Jews don't know. I remember one musician, particularly a very spiritual guy, when he heard that I said Jews believe there's a soul, he was shocked. He thought Jews didn't believe there was a soul. Now, that, that took, you know, I was surprised by that because, but yeah, because he, it's not with the Judaism. Judaism he grew up with, he says, it was about having a lot of grapefruits for the Kiddush and having wall-to-wall carpeting and the different appeals made in Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and so on. That was his Judaism. Um, so I decided, because I was speaking to people coming from a very different background, I decided because everybody stereotypes and everybody has prejudices, I decided, you know what, I don't know, I'm sitting there with a beard and a yarmulke, um, and I may be evoking all kinds of images in people that are not neutral, like uh, I may remind someone of an angry grandfather that slept into synagogue and Yom Kippur against his will, or some other aggressive, dogmatic, religious person or someone that cheated in business. So I decided to um, try an experiment. Instead of using any religious terms, including God, I created my own language. Instead of God, I used the words higher reality, or the essence of it all. Or if it was a particularly new age group, I used words like um, non-existential, undefined layers of energy. That was very intriguing. Okay. Non-existential existence. And instead of Torah, I used the word blueprint or roadmap. Instead of mitzvahs, connections. And instead of Mashiach, Geula, I used the word destination. And here I was waxing eloquent and pontificating about the process of discovering the essence of it all by following this blueprint, making connections to seamlessly integrate the body and soul, the inner and the outer, in one total fusion of the non-existential and the existential. And I remember people were sitting there and they were like, you know, they were very, very intrigued. Mesmerized, I would even say. After a few weeks, a guy came over to me and says to me, are you talking about God? And I said, yes, but shh, don't spoil it for the others. I've told the story many times because it taught me a tremendous lesson. You know, the experiment worked. Words mean everything. We think we live in a world where they say, Communicate. Break the silence in therapy. She doesn't know what you're thinking or feeling. He doesn't know what you're thinking or feeling. Talk. So yes, communication is important because it allows you to share what you're feeling. Other people are not going to guess. Silence is worse than the rape, as they say. You need to break the silence. But there's something about words and communication that also has a downside, has the other side of it. It could also be a barrier. If I use a word that for you 
is a negative connotation, it's the worst word I can use. I can use a word that for me is an innocuous, innocent word, but you, every time your mother said that word, she, every time someone said the word, your mother went ballistic. How am I supposed to know? That's why I always suggest people, couples and so on, in therapy, if you're not communicating, try to use completely different language because you're using words that have already been said so many times that without even thinking, your spouse is really going crazy every time you say that word. You could say exactly the same thing with a new language. You'll be surprised what, you, what you'll discover because words are loaded. The word God is a loaded word. I actually hate using it, to be honest, because I know when I say it, it means something else for every person. How do I know what God means to you? You never told me. You know, it could be a juvenile image. It could be God relates. Many people associate, and I've tested this, free association. Take the Woody Allen stereotype of God. These are the words that come up with God without even thinking. Anger, guilt, punishment, conscience, dogma, laws, commandments, etc., etc. Every word that's angry, fear. How many people hear the word God? They say, oh, love, warmth, comfort, and so on. Some do, but, some, but many don't. That's why you'll find in America, many Western, the Western world at least, they say 90% of Americans say they believe in some form of God. They're spiritual. And 40% will say they associate with any particular religion. That's a very big discrepancy, 40 and 90. You know why? Because religion is associated with dogma, with ritual, I should say. And spiritual is, is, is connected to free spirit. When's the last time you thought that a religious person has a free spirit? People who have free spirits are usually not religious, and people who are religious usually don't have free spirits, are not spiritual. Because religion associates with ritual, even beautiful ritual, blind faith, and spirituality is, 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 uh, elicits feelings of soulfulness, music, free spiritedness, exploration, adventure. The fact is, it's a tragedy because Judaism was always built that, that religion and spiritual and ritual, actually SPI plus ritual is what Judaism is about. It's the fusion of action and soul. As a matter of fact, it's about the mechanics of Judaism. Without a soul, it's like a body. Without a soul, a corpse. It's dead. Imagine sitting at a Passover Seder or Shabbat or any other tradition and just doing it mechanically, robotically. Who's it going to turn on? Who's it going to inspire? So some people find they have traditions they like. It's nostalgic. that makes their mother and father, grandfather, grandmother happy. It has good memories. I'm not taking away, but that's still very superficial. When you discover that Judaism is really a spiritual system and these mechanical rituals are just tools, just like sitting at a piano. Imagine someone sitting at a piano and never hearing music. Who wants to take lessons and, and read music and, 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 you know, and you never hear the music? That's like doing rituals without the soul. But a soul without rituals is also not grounded. So it's a whole different take on what God is. That's why I began, we have to challenge. I would not even try to explain God to anybody. I would start challenging, what do you think God means? First eliminate all the stereotypes, and then you'll begin to say, okay, let the real God now stand up. First you have to get rid of your preconceived notions. And we all have preconceived notions. The whole point of God is to get rid of human preconceived notions. That's what God means. It's going into the creator's set of, state of mind instead of our state of mind, which is very, very different. To the point we cannot always, will not fully ever understand. That's why God says to Moses, no man can see me and live. But if you eliminate your self and your individuality and your ego, you can begin to get a taste of what I am like. But you're never going to get a taste on your terms. Because all you'll get is then... You know, like if, if like Abraham came to the conclusion, if God's going to be a, 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 what's the word, a result of a mathematical equation, is that a God we want? A God, my mathematical equations show there's a God. That's the God you want? That's a God that's a product of my logic. It's exactly the other way around. It's the God that created logic that you want to connect with. So the end of the day is the God that you choose to relate to is the God that you'll be destined with. And unfortunately, in most cases, it's not a God worth uh, valuing, to put it very bluntly. So it's about challenging ourselves, our looking at ourselves, how we define what exists, what is reality, what is valuable, what isn't valuable. Now, I hope I did some justice to this topic. It's a very extensive topic, as you can imagine. 
But I thought it's important to talk about. If necessary, I, I can continue it next week. I'll see, you know, just since, you know. Um, but we have to have some limit here, you know. At the end of the day, we're not God, so we can't go on forever. You know, we do have curfews and limits and tension span, and you get tired and exhausted. But I think this is sing- singly, to me personally, is the most intriguing topic of all, because it lies the heart of everything. What is real? You know, so I'll conclude with a Hasidic story, which really captures this very nicely. There was this um, philosopher, we call him Masnagid, non Hasid, arguing with a Hasid. So he was the rationalist, and the Hasid was the mystic, who could be sometimes perceived by a rationalist as being unrealistic. Okay? You know, Western thinker and Eastern type of thinking, circle and square. You know, a square has edges, circle is somewhat more. Uh, elusive and they were arguing about debating the existence of God and the proofs for and the proofs against and back and forth you know one of these endless marathon arguments that go nowhere finally the chassid is all agitated and says you know what enough is enough let me just tell you this I am you know you I must say you think about God all the time I have to admit that I think about myself all the time. And with that, they parted ways. Now, this scholar, this philosopher, this non chassid felt it was like, a, wow, that's a great compliment coming from such a distinguished man. He's saying that he thinks about himself, and I'm thinking about God all the time. So he went away, patting himself on the back like he's like uh, got the ultimate compliment. And he shared it with friends and shared it with others for a number of years until finally... One day someone illuminated, someone enlightened him to the fact that actually the chassid insulted him and he wasn't even aware. What the chassid was saying to him is, you think about God all the time because you know you exist. So your question is, does God exist? So you ponder, maybe God exists, maybe God doesn't exist. So you're you're consumed with God. The chassid knows a given that God exists. His question is whether he exists. So he thinks about himself all the time. Do I exist? Do I not exist? Why am I here? What's my purpose? You see the difference? It's not just semantics. It's what's the given. For a person who realizes and doesn't take himself so seriously and realizes God is a given. There's no question there's a higher reality. The question is about our reality, how real it really is, and what role does it play. Because we need justification. God does not need to be justified. Creator does not need a proof that exists. We need proof that we exist, and we need to justify why we're here, because we're not self-made. So that's for sure that we didn't create ourselves. That's a given. So the question is why you're here. To turn ourselves into gods because it makes us comfortable is obviously the most intellectually dishonest thing to do because we're not gods. We are not creators. We create nothing in this world. Everything we shape, even the most greatest things, is shaping it from something else. Even the children we give birth to, we all know, any parent knows, it humbles you. What right did you earn to be able to bring a child to this world? It's like what you came up with some like type of innovation. You paid a price. God blessed us with a gift that when a man and woman meet and uh, a a seed uh, um, um, for um, uh, a seed. uh, What's the word I want to say? Fertilizes an egg. Right? Something happens. Something magical that begins the process called life. It should humble us, not make us think, "Oh, wow, we're self-made human beings." So we have to question, why are we here? So he thinks about himself all day. Or another way to put it is, if God created, wanted to destroy the universe, what would he do? So the philosopher, the thinker who thinks existence is real, says he would bring a flood, kill all life, then he would burn into the whole world, spread the ashes. And someone who knows a little Hasidic thought, a mystical thought would answer, God would simply do nothing. He'd stop will- willing existence. He would stop breathing, stop speaking, and existence would... Sees being. Because existence is not a given. Existence needs justification. Whereas God does not need justification. So, with that said, as I said, I hope I did some justice to this. If this can keep you if sleepless tonight, that would be a good sign. I don't know if it will. Because that means, you know, start thinking whether you really exist, whether you're going to wake up tomorrow morning, and God, I don't mean that in a negative way, but I mean to say whether your existence warrants and justifies now we, I know we all feel that we are here forever and we will be here forever and we should be. But uh, we all know that that's our own, uh, that's, uh, that's our feeling. That doesn't mean it's real. 
And I want to discuss maybe next week I'll talk a little more about where does that feeling come from that we feel like we're creators. Like we feel we don't have a beginning or an end, even though our logic dictates that we do. So we'll leave that question for next week, which is a fascinating answer given by the Balatanya in, in Tanya. So I want to wish everybody a very godly week, thinking about God, not on your terms, but on God's terms, trying to elevate ourselves to that higher reality. And um, uh, we continue, of course, the journey to 49 days of the Omer. I have some more Omer books some people asked me to bring, so I have as well as you can get the emails that come out that we send every day in that free app, My Omer. And please see us at the Meaningful Life Center. We're all here together in the journey of trying to find God in our lives. A God that, redefining God in a way that can make sense. And coming to realize that um, it, uh, it forces you to rethink who you are and of course who God is and your purpose in existence. So thank you again. Until next week, everybody. Thank you.